Good evening, everybody. My name is M. Solarova. I'm the program manager here at Czech Center New York, and I'm thrilled to welcome you with us tonight for this Good presentation. Good evening, everybody. My name is M. Solarova. I'm the program manager here. Oh, wow. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, like I was saying, I'm really thrilled to welcome you here for this presentation and discussion with acclaimed filmmaker and photographer Jan S. Vatos, the director of the Arc of Light and Shadows. Jan S. Vatos is an independent director and producer of documentary films. He has made over a dozen documentaries, many of which have been in competition at international festivals and earned him numerous awards, including the Jade Kunlun Award, Special Jury Award, and Special Jury Award at Vladimir Puchalski International Nature Film Festival in Lodz, Poland. Among his many achievements is organizing the photographic backtracking expedition in 2010, when he spent 40 days in the inhospitable regions of Northern Kenya, taking photographs with old analog devices and developing films in portable dark room. His films are characterized by his deep and long lasting interest in the subject matters which allows him to present it from an unusual point of view. In his movies, he often dismantles social and cultural stereotypes. His profound concern for the environment is palpable in his work. He cooperates with many international organizations and his writing is frequently featured in Czech media. His latest film, The Arc of Lights and Shadows, follows the work and legacy of outstanding American filmmakers and writers and adventurers, Martin and Osa Johnson, presented for the first time in a new perspective. The Johnsons were trailblazing wildlife filmmakers at a time when Hollywood films were being shot in studios with trained zoo animals, when sound recording was just being invented and color film was a thing of the future. They were true pioneers of courageous and authentic documentary filmmaking. And this film is an important piece in preserving and celebrating their legacy. There will be a discussion following the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat at any point. I am also very excited that the curator of Martin and Osa Johnson's Safari Museum in Kansas, Jacqueline Zimmer, will be joining us for the discussion as well. If you've seen the Arc of Lights and Shadows, you've seen her and the museum in the film. This event is presented in partnership with the museum in, and we are very thankful for their support. And now I'd like to introduce the director of Czech Center New York, Mr. Miroslav Konvalina to say a few words. Here, there. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Em, and thanks uh, to Jan Svatoš for his upcoming lecture and discussion. And let me also welcome you to our first program of the year and a very uh, unusual one at that. Uh, it is for the first time the Czech Center New York uh, history that uh, the main photo promoting an event features a leopard and African predator with no obvious connection to Czech culture. But at the same time, this is no coincidence uh, that uh, the young Czech couple, Jan Svatoš and Tromi Strakova, got inspired by the legendary American pioneers of photo and film safari. The Czechs who live um, in a small country in the heart of Europe have always been interested in nature and travel, including uh, exotic destinations, and they always cared for the environment. Uh, my generation uh, grew up uh, with a TV series uh, about uh, Elsa and Lyonis, uh, which was inspired by the first films made by Martin and Osa Johnson. But uh, there is another passion that uh, we share. I'm not sure whether you are aware of this, but uh, the Czechs love travel lectures, travel slideshows, and travel movies. In each town, both big and small, it is common for lectures uh, by contemporary travelers to be held all year around. Uh, they take place at schools, um, uh, local pubs, um, you know, culture centers, and uh, turn out uh, a large numbers of people and they love listening to the present day explorers talk about their journeys. And sometimes they actually join them for their next trip. I understand that uh, this year we will celebrate 100 uh, years from the uh, Johnson's first journey to Africa. 
uh, at the time uh, following their return, they came to New York and held talks, presentations in order to uh, raise funds for donors, including museums. Uh, but there is uh, one American state with an even closer connections uh, to Osa and Martin Johnson. It is uh, the state of Kansas. And now please allow me to introduce the Czech Honorary Consul in Kansas, Sharon Valašek, who will uh, now say a few words. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Merrick. Um, as a, a Czech Honorary Consul for the Midwestern states of Kansas and Missouri, um, one of my roles is to promote the Czech Republic in the area of culture. So I'm very pleased to be included in tonight's program, which I sure, I'm sure will be quite interesting. Well, I'm based here in Kansas City, and uh, we do have um, a Czech contingent here. We have a Czech and Slovak club whose members typically are either immigrants themselves or they have some sort of family connection to the two countries. And just as Czechs and Slovaks for that matter uh, in the homeland like nature, being out in nature and preserving nature and also traveling, so do the, the Czechs and Slovaks here in the Kansas City region. I was really pleased to learn about this, the uh, Svatos project, which supports the Safari Museum dedicated to the legacy of Martin and Osa Johnson. Well, how does a Czech filmmaker become connected to Chinook, Kansas? Chinook, Kansas is where the Safari Museum is. Well, briefly, I'll, I'll, I, you will learn more about that tonight, but Osa Martin grew up in Chinook that's where her mother lived until the mother passed away and her mother was very instrumental in founding the museum. You will hear more about that tonight. And then where is Chanute? Well, Chanute is uh, a town of approximately 9,000 people around two hours south of, south of Kansas City. And Kansas City is in um, Eastern Kansas and so uh, in Western Missouri, since the states are next to each other. Um, so it's, it's really just, uh, Chanute is just a couple hours drive from here. Um, Martin and Osa had ties to Kansas City. Uh, they, they met, when they met, um, Osa was too young to be married in the state of Kansas. So they came to Kansas City, went to the train station, Union Station in Kansas City, Missouri, and they were legally married there. They, and they got married just three weeks after they met. Kansas City was also their hub for getting supplies for their trips and also the starting point for the train trips from Union Station. I spoke with Jackie Zimmer, who's curator at the museum earlier today, and she said that um, Chanute was a former train hub for kind of four major cities from, from that area, Kansas City, Wichita, Tulsa, and Joplin and that um, they do get a number of visitors from to the museum from the Kansas City area, especially uh, when the museum is featured in our local media. So I hope that um, it's also the case for all of you joining, anyone participating, whether you're near or far, that um, after you hear this program, you might be inspired to visit the museum in Chinook, Kansas. So thank you very much for inviting me tonight, and I'm looking forward to hearing the program now. So uh, hello everybody. Uh, perhaps this is my turn just to introduce myself with the uh, with the uh, live screening, and I will then uh, skip to the presentation. So I wish you all of you. I wish you a wonderful evening, whether you are in the United States or good night. <laughs> if you are following us uh, uh, in Europe, this is my case because I'm in in Czech Republic, and it's uh, 1 a.m. deep night here, and uh, outside is uh, silence like in Africa. 
So my task is today to take you uh, to do uh, to do a, a bit making of trip uh, to do uh, to do northern Kenya especially, and also we'll visit the shortly uh, Kansas, uh, which was which have, uh, which has been spoken about for for a while. So if I may, I will just skip to the presentation. So uh, right now you should see. Uh, the opening slide of the of my lecture, the birth of uh, cinematic wildlife. Uh, the cinematic is very important. The word cinematic is important because people usually forgot when they uh, are watching any documentary or uh, any films or uh, reading any visual reportage in uh, travelogues. So they they forgot this is just the image of the wildlife. I'll be speaking about it. So. Uh, First of all, or maybe to or to begin with, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to uh, say a bit about my documentary career because we are uh, as what as was uh, as was said before by Mirek, uh, we are working together with my wife uh, Romy, who is a, a cinematographer, and I am a director, uh, making a few uh, making a few uh, documentaries uh, about mainly about the environment we made a few films in africa and we were filming also in uh, in, uh, uh, in the united states and uh, the the first thing uh, which was should be said before we go uh, off to the africa is the thing that when i was get before i get there for the first time uh, my dream uh, about the wild uh, Africa was the summer uh, because even myself as a small child I was uh, watching uh, the uh, Elsa the Lioness the, the Hollywood movies uh, out of Africa. Uh, I was reading travelogues like National Geographic watching documentaries with, uh, with a thrill of a small child and when I or before I get to the Africa for the first time in 2007 so I was thinking that I will discover the things which I was, which I watched in the documentaries, and uh, this was my very first experience uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in Africa, and it was not pleasure one. It was uh, what you are seeing now is my uh, early experience in Africa in the National Park Nakuru in uh, Kenya. It was the situation when uh, a leopard, uh, the the leopard, the, the very precious predator. And very photogenic one uh, appeared on a, on a one acacia tree and our driver just got information in his radio and he was trying to get us there um, but before we reached the place uh, another let's say 20 or 25 cars get in front of us and what was i what i was experiencing at that time was more than africa it was like a morning traffic jam uh, cars full of people and every car there was at least six or eight people all of them has uh, or have, have been holding uh, his camera and the only creature which was very su surprised at the time was the leopard on a tree because i think he wouldn't believe wouldn't have believed uh, his eyes at that time i remember clearly that i just uh, put my uh, photographic camera on the back seat of the car and i uh, was uh, my image of africa was a bit spoiled and since that, I was thinking how to make, uh, if it is very even possible to make a different approach uh, of uh, African wildlife tribes and people or animals uh, in, in the future as a, as a photographer, because at that time I was studying FAMU University. When I got back to, uh, when I got back home to the Czech Republic, and so I was continuing in studies in uh, FAMU University, which is one of the most famous film school. And I was still kept because my love was uh, the history of photography, the history of uh, filmmaking, and the passion for Africa. And I was trying to find something, some new approach, how to uh, how to realize my own project. And it was during the studies oh, when I also were was uh, focused in, in, by international cases and uh, controversial, controversial uh, photographic causas uh, in, in connection to Africa. I, I would like to mention two of them. Uh, the first one, which is uh, connected with the, my approach to Africa, is the causa of uh, French 
photographer Gilles Nicolet, uh, who was cooperating with the National Geographic. In 2004, uh, he made an, an amazing uh, series of uh, wildlife uh, of uh, an ethnics uh, in Tanzania, the so-called Barabaik people. And it was set in the beginning of the uh, of the reportage that the Barabaiks are the tribes who, who are uh, hunting elephants with the uh, tribal uh, means, which means like using the spears and that kind of way. And on some certain certain pages, uh, there was the the picture you are now watching, and the description below the pictures was just saying that. Uh, Barabaik's warrior are, uh, are taking of, uh, the task from elephants freshly or the task from freshly hunted uh, an elephant. Uh, immediately when the reportage was off and on, on, in the sale, so there was uh, hundreds of emails coming to the editor in chief and to the, to the, uh, to the other editors. Why uh, there is on these two pages uh, with the Barabaik hunters, when you can see the uh, yellow circle, why there is apparent uh, a number and or an apparent number from the Tanzania uh, Wildlife Authority, which was meant that on a, uh, on a task there was written a number that uh, the tusks were borrowed, not hunted from the wild, wild elephants. So it was clear that Nicolette just faked uh, all the uh, some of the uh, some of the stories. And it was very serious because National Geographic solved a problem. And for me as a, or for any visual storyteller or visual artist, it is just one of the hundreds of cases where uh, the photographers coming to the, it doesn't matter whether it is Africa or, or South America uh, are or searching for wildlife, but they start uh, from many reasons, they just start faking it. And it is very, very dangerous. And another case is just to mention: this is not, uh, not uh, an African animal. Uh, I guess you know it, but uh, it's very uh, important. Uh, another story to just mention shortly: it was the picture of Jose Luis Rodriguez, and uh, he was a winner of prestigious Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. And uh, this picture was also said that it was uh, the, the wildlife or the wild wolf uh, uh, jumping over uh, the fence and uh, getting closer to the to the herds of sheep. So it's really it looks like made during the full moon night, and it's re it, it looks really uh, amazing. Um, just the problem was that uh, it was again it was staged because uh, shortly after announcing the winner. Uh, a farm in Spain just says, "Hey, uh, this we know this animal because it's it was uh, photographed in our farm uh, of the farm where are kept uh, uh, the wolves used for filmmaking. So again, it was not wild wolf, but it was like uh, it was like making the picture like you have uh, a trained dog, just uh, saying to the, to him how uh, he he should jump over the, the fence." So again, this case of uh, Jose Luis Rodriguez, it was, it was uh, something which was not wild anymore. Uh, and back to, to Africa, because uh, in the, if you kept all these things and causes in mind, so still the, uh, it's still the question of uh, the Africa, which is made uh, and shaped by the media and the Africa itself. What I just want to add to before we get to the Northern Kenya is like that uh, I like as a photographer and filmmaker, why I like Africa is from many reasons, not only because of the tribal people there, but also uh, of the basic fact, because maybe you know the debunction, the dark continent, uh, which is still some, somehow using today, maybe in a bad way, but from a, uh, from a perspective of a filmmaker, if you approach the Africa during the night, so as you can now see from the NASA picture, uh, the the continent is still covered by the darkness, and the darkness is there to to keep some mysteries, some uh, surprises. It still kept some untold stories, and uh, this is really something um, good for any filmmaker or photographer. And there is one paradox uh, through the through the history, because as you can see, the Africa is very close to the Europe, but the 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 paradox what I was what I was 
what I want just to mention is like, if you uh, know the African uh, or the history of uh, discovering African continent, so it, it is that fact that uh, even though it was li or lying closer to the Europe, uh, the interior of the entire continent was discovered much more later than the other continents. So it's from this perspective, it somehow still kept, it's the youngest continent speaking about the, what we know about it. And the wildlife uh, or the, the, the famous uh, scouting journeys like the Livingstone and Stanley and all these uh, amazing travelers through the times just proves it that uh, all of the, the expeditions were made uh, at uh, not, not almost recently, it's almost 100 and something years. Uh, just to add, uh, when Africa meets my passion, the history of uh, um, photographing and filmmaking, just to show a few really funny pictures to just have an idea how the, the beginnings of filmmaking and taking pictures or uh, trying to make the first uh, documentary was really hard. Uh, what, what you can see now on a slideshow is the, the biggest camera called uh, the Mammoth. Uh, it was made in America. It is the first really large format camera. Uh, if we now uh, want to make any really um, full, full resolution image, we will we'll need much more smaller, I guess, uh, the technique. This camera was uh, uh, coped with uh, eight people. Uh, if you need one picture, so you need eight people to be able to uh, make the, the picture. If you look to the any historical picture of first, uh, uh, let's say, mobile cameras, you still got images like this when you can see like some white hunter in Africa holding uh, this enormous uh, hand camera. Uh, I guess that any image come from the camera has to, had to be blur, blurred. And the photographer itself, uh, I think he was kept in a, in a dilemma whether to hold the, the gun or the camera and just be afraid of any dangers hidden around. And uh, like a third example of a very funny, uh, at, um, like a proof of a very uh, funny times uh, of, a, of photographing scouts, you can see the picture of Carol Akeley approach when he wanted to make a closer image of an ostrich. Uh, he is hidden inside the camouflage animal and he has or had to pay attention whether he choose the right, whether it was, whether he was closing, coming closer to the female ostrich or male ostrich because the male ostrich are very, uh, very competitive when meeting uh, one each other. So uh, because there were no tele, tele lenses in the time, so there was the funny things how you can make better picture if to, 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 to get closer to the animals. It was really not funny. And what you can see now, so I will just let the picture for a while. You can, um, it, it's really, I get, I admit it's really, really old. You can see it from the color, uh, but uh, why it is unique, it is the very first or the oldest, maybe the oldest picture of a giraffe uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, just give you a few seconds, if you can see, or if you can find giraffe anywhere. This is just the proof that this kind of picture couldn't compete in a wildlife competition today because the, the giraffe, if you haven't found it, I uh, will help you. It's uh, hidden really uh, in a really far background. It's here, I will just enlarge it it's just to prove it, it is there. And perhaps uh, the, the, the unknown photographer who took the, this picture was very happy because he even maybe didn't intend to take a picture of the giraffe. He was perhaps what uh, historian says, he was taking the picture of the landscape. And in the moment when he took, pressed the button, so the giraffe came into and it was put in the, in the, uh, in the picture. So uh, again, it was because of the old technique didn't, just to say, uh, we, at that time, the photographers hadn't the LCD displays we now have on now, because if you watch for an iPhone or every digital camera, you will see immediately what will be in the picture. Our old cameras haven't uh, that attention. They have just uh, different, different um, technique. 
how to make the picture. So they have to put the glass off and then put the cassette with the films to be able to take the picture. So uh, let's move to the uh, to the time when Martin and Osa Johnson started taking the pictures. So now uh, those pictures are uh, from the Safari Museum for Martin and Osa Johnson. This is the very uh, and that one, which is really scary, just illustrates how uh, difficult that time was speaking about uh, wildlife protection, because in the time when Martin firstly came to the Africa, there were no national parks, no tourism. Uh, it was totally different Africa. Uh, the only people who, or the majority of the people who came there from the America or Europe was white hunters, uh, usually from the rich uh, families or some uh, uh, factories who just came there for shooting and taking uh, the, trof the trophy of the dead animals, like uh, you can see now on, 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 on the screen, the dead rhino. And the hunters were the only interpreters of uh, wildlife Africa, and of, of course, because they want to 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 boast their um, uh, their own Africa, so they were telling story about the wild, uh, dangerous beasts, um, like that. All the animals were very fierce and will be uh, threatening anybody from uh, white people who came there. So because they the the, the more dangerous the beasts were. The, the more brave uh, their story uh, was, this is clear. And uh, precisely in this moment, it was 1921, uh, when Martin and Osa came first to do, to do, uh, to do Africa, and they came, uh, they came there in, in a time uh, also taking their own, uh, their own uh, images of, uh, of uh, Africa formed by the hunters, and they just they just uh, found a different story because they saw that uh, the animals were threatening. Martin was the pioneer filmmaker who uh, made amazing uh, uh, cheap of work uh, to, 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 to improve the uh, night taking wildlife pictures in, uh, in the night using magnesium flash powder. He was the first uh, filmmaker who came to Africa in a search and finding and getting the sound film uh, in uh, Belgian Congo at that time. And he was the one of the first filmmakers who uh, made the aerial safari and make a uh, amazing and take an amazing uh, aerial picture of the wildlife uh, and uh, even the, the films. And now we just came to do our first film because when I uh, discovered the, the mention of uh, the, the short the short sentence that uh, I just clearly remember when uh, on the lecture on Ofami University when I just uh, heard from the from the script that there was some Martin Johnson um, who made two uh, films in Africa. Right? Uh, it was Simba and Congorilla, and uh, I was so completely amazed by that uh, that uh, information because I know from my uh, from my uh, family studies that. All the so-called African wildlife films before were just faked. Uh, it was not made in Africa. It, it was either the case of the uh, lion hunt, which was made in the 1907, or it did result in Africa. Some of the movies were made in Africa, but uh, even the producers make different movies just to make a bigger success of the film. So they stage it in the in the zoos. Uh, and there was nobody who can be called like the really a good documentarist at the time. And Martin Johnson and Osa Johnson were uh, among the first who tried to make both pictures and uh, films. And my uh, own expedition came to the Northern Kenya for 40 days uh, to just to find out uh, because we've taken uh, old analog technique uh, to whether to find out whether like the modern man can is able to, to make a wildlife film or fo fo photographs with um, uh, analog technique. So the movie was successful. It was called Africa Obscura and it won three international awards. So we've taken like you can see now this is the uh, Bolex camera 16 millimeter, 16 millimeter uh, camera uh, on a spring. So this was the one of the, uh, the technique we got, and it was uh, even like uh, we've taken around along as a large format camera. Uh, for that camera, you, you need the black cloth, which is just flying in the air on my on my uh, on my back. You can see it really 
even there in, in, the, in this picture, which was taken on the top of the uh, mountain Ol Olokwe in um, uh, near Evasangiro River in the right, in the southern of the northern Kenya region. And uh, here's my wife. For the first time, I will see you a few pictures later in, in a while. Uh, this is Romy, who was taking the dig digital technique uh, that time. And even nowadays, she is the one behind the camera. Uh, just a few words about the Northern Kenya because really it's my passion. Uh, uh, if you see on a satellite picture of the Northern of the of the Kenya itself, so you can clearly see from the first impression that there are two Kenyas. In fact, the first one, the southern part is greener. It's much more. There is much more uh, precipitations. There is much more water. Uh, the landscape is greener. More animals, more people, and even more tourism. Like the north is uh, completely uh, the opposite. You can see, like from the from the uh, from the colors, it's it's vasted area. It's much more closer to the almost to the desert. Just from a few uh, exceptions, if you see right in the middle of the, in the north, you can see some like a green islands. I will just discuss it in a, in a, in, a, in a few minutes. So just take it in a mind in a memory. Uh, so called the green islands. It's are the volcanic mountains which are like the uh, the islands of the green uh, for the people and animals, which uh, allows the life um, being there in this harsh region. Uh, the, the northern Kenya region uh, used to have very bad reputations because till 1991 uh, there was uh, there was emergency state, so uh, make, like uh, the, like uh, the remnants of the civil wars because in the, the northern Kenya region is uh, lived by amazing uh, wild, uh, amazing tribes like uh, the uh, Turkana people, the Burana, the Gabra, uh, Samburu, and those tribes uh, were fighting again about uh, like the pastures and the water sources. And there's also issues uh, concerning the poaching. This is the picture from my friend, uh, Jack Marubu, who is uh, uh, used to work as a uh, Kenya Wildlife uh, Service Ranger, and this is the picture uh, from uh, from anti poaching patrol when they just says the the ivory hidden in the Mount Marsabit. So uh, it has really the security issues, and it but the, the landscape itself. If you can now see the few pictures, I will just show you. Uh, it's amazing. It's like a country or landscape of. Uh, some amazing planet in, a, in our solar system. It's a different world. It's really harsh. It's, uh, it's, uh, the temperatures are coming high. It's really um, not good for uh, transportation, but uh, like if you see the pictures from, uh, from the car or if you go there on a foot, so it looks like more than Mars, like the planet Mars. Uh, but the good point is like the, uh, the system of contrast. Uh, I'm now coming back to the, uh, to the green, so-called green island, because you go through the, this harsh uh, wasteland and you start climbing up to the volcanic mountains, like a mountain Marsabit, which has a special, uh, special atmosphere uh, rich on, uh, rich on uh, precipitations because it's almost two kilometers high. So the, uh, the air which was uh, climbing up the mountains start cooling and even in the dry season uh, there is some rain and some mist it's a really amazing uh, system which allows uh, like the primeval forest to grow uh, and the primeval forest kept more water moisture so that the wildlife came, came there and even like the tribes uh, are pushing their cattle there to to get some water and this was like the place when Martin took uh, the first wildlife films because this this uh, ecosystem was kept far from the hunters and it was so so unique and so calm for filming that almost 100 years ago or precisely 100 years ago uh, allowed Martin to to be there and he he debunked it with the Osa uh, the paradise because just behind the corner there is a lake paradise. Uh, which is like the, the best monument for uh, to be remember Martin and Osa. And uh, this is something really, we, if you read any uh, in any uh, guidebook, touristic guide, guidebook, so uh, he deter people from coming to the Northern Kenya. So our expedition that time in 2010, it was something 
which goes against uh, that stereotypes because uh, the north was it's really a huge area uh, of course there are some area which are dangerous but some of them or the majority of them are uh, or at that time it was safe uh, and it was wonderful and you can't just simply say that some, this is something uh, you, you shouldn't have seen uh, Martin at time uh, in the while on the Lake Paradise he was building uh, his own dark room we were at that time my team was taking my own uh, mobile dark room because also we wanted to uh, develop a few pictures Martin as uh, you can see this is the dark room uh, near or atop Mount Marsabit so you can see that the uh, the, the boys are just filling the, the tanks with the water to prepare uh, the storage. Uh, this is Martin in the work uh, in, in, the, in the field developing the pictures before he built the, the, the camera. And this is another archive picture of Martin preparing the nice scene uh, with the bait of that found the zebra to be able to shoot the lions during the night, which is this case. Now you can see if you watched our film, so uh, this is really the beginning when we are trying to uh trying to reconstruct uh, the magnesium flesh powder which was very really dangerous to uh, to cope with because of the really high temperature of burning and just another interesting th thing to add uh, martin has to develop all the pictures not only the good ones which we prefer now but it was analog time so uh especially when he was taking picture with the uh, night traps so it it meant to develop uh all the pictures, even the, the bad ones. So, and uh, what was what what uh, what uh, surprising or surprising has to, had to be at the time when he developed MA, one of those uh, most famous uh, night pictures, which made him really famous during the wild. This is just a few pictures from the Mount Marsabit National Park. Just from the uh, we have special permission to uh, to stay and to camp really in the wild just in the middle of the national park because uh, the cooperation with the Kenya Wildlife Service is our camp really uh, right in the middle of the crater of the uh, Lake Paradise. Like this is another case of how we spent some of the nights during our 40 days expedition in Northern Kenya. This is the uh, village uh, old trot in uh, near Mount Kulal. Uh, uh, it is the village of the Samburu herdsmen. Or we came, this is our camp, uh on the top of the table Ololokwe mountain uh we were also get there in a two days trip uh, with the donkey uh with the donkeys of the samburu herdsmen we got there and we were sleeping with my wife uh, under the sky it was one of the most uh, amazing experience i got in uh, in uh, in africa at all because i just clearly remember the starry night and the the men from the Samburu telling the stories in their own language languages and the, uh, the 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 flame and the smell of the wildlife it was one of the most or maybe best and experience from Africa uh, with, from which I have no picture from the knife of course but I just it is something I really recall uh, very often as I said, we uh, came there to to prove, uh, to try to uh, make uh, film developing. So this is just our uh, camp. You can see like the plastic uh, uh, bottles in the foreground. It's, it's it's a developer, the fixer we take along. From speaking about it, it was really it was really uh, it was really most difficult on the expedition. Not to got through the 40 days through the Northern Kenya region with the harsh lands. But uh, before the most difficult on the expedition was uh, to getting the uh, permission from EU and from the uh, our air transport partner to, to take along the chemicals uh, aboard of our plane. So this was one of the most difficult thing we solved. Uh, it was really funny that we experienced it in Europe, not in Africa itself. Uh, in this picture, you can see myself in a mobile dark room, which was uh, we just specially designed uh, a special tent for growing uh, the plants, and uh, we we made it like to be a, like the mobile dark room and even like the dryer of the uh, developed uh, negatives I did. And now, following eight pictures are 
are made by myself. It's my pictures of Africa. You can see also uh, the rest of the uh, the chemicals in the in the in the sky, and uh, those pictures were taken at that ex expedition in 2010 uh, and developed uh, in a, in a, uh, in a, the mobile darkroom. So they don't need any commentary. I'll just I will just get through for it. It's Mars a bit belly of the amazing and old trees. I like simply the landscape. This is the singing wells of a Borana tribes. This is almost before the dusk, the elephant who came closer to our camp in Lake Paradise. This is the look to the uh, Lake Turkana. This is the leopard. Mirek just mentions my most favorite picture I did. I, uh, I made in Africa during the rain. It was just a short while when the leopard appeared on a tree during the rain because he didn't like water coming falling from the from the sky. This is the crater uh, from the Lake Paradise, uh, and you can see even like the, the big elephant is pretty pretty small in comparison to the uh, to the crater. Of the former Volcana crater, former Volcana Volcana. This is from our camp, closer to the the primeval forest in the very morning. This is on top of the Ololoka mountain. So the cycas is, which is amazing how all the plants are growing there at top of the mountains. And this is the reticulated giraffe, one of the most uh, amazing creatures living just in the north, along with the grevy zebras and garanooks which is another reason why Northern Kenya is unique, because you can see uh, just some animals who live there. It's, it's really are amazing, even really visually. And of course, like the people, uh, my wife from is expert on, on the tribes, she loves them. And uh, in, uh, in this sense, uh, the North is the paradise because uh, the, the tribal cultures there are just amazing and they still kept their traditional way of life. This is the Gabra woman. Back to the, uh, our expedition, this is the Martin's picture uh, of his dark room and I'm showing there because uh, that time 2010, almost at the end of the, our uh, expedition, uh, the biggest success we made was discovering right in the middle of the primeval forest, we discovered the place with no clues. It was just like uh, my photographic memory and studying Martin's pictures and uh, his uh, travelogues. So we just uh, found the tree uh, which, which prove where the Martin mobile, uh, Martin darkroom used to stay. And it was the biggest discovery, which didn't, was not made even by the, by the other people who came there to, in, a, in a search to find it. So we were first to find it. And also these uh, two pictures were the key uh, of the cooperation with the Safari Museum later and with the uh, Robert O'Brien from the Kenya Wildlife Service, which helped a lot uh, in a future films when we are preparing these films, Arcs of Lights and Shadows. I see that the time is running, so I'll just uh, try to make it a bit uh, shorter, the comments, because uh, before the Arc of Lights and Shadows was like the, I, I was just in the, during one night, I just woke up and I thought, why we haven't made a, a feature film about Martin and Osa, because there was none at that time. And speaking about the length of 90 minutes. So we decided uh, in 2015 to make uh, some preparations to be able to fundraise the money uh, because we need to get to the uh, to many places, not only to the to do uh, to do Africa, to Kenya, to Botswana, but also to the Kansas. So we started. Uh, I started the filming uh, from the first place I, I was heading for was uh, Los Angeles because I met with uh, world filmmaker Werner Herzog, who was also like a story storyteller consultant of the whole project, who was a big fan of our film. And I spoke to him recently during the spring uh, lockdown. And he again, he just wrote me that he and I was pleased by that. Why not? That he uh, during the the spring lockdown he was uh, watching again the arc of lights and shadows and he liked it uh, a lot. So uh, this is something I just admit it is something for me very important, like uh, to get an an, uh, an international award of 
or just pleasure for anybody who sees the films and praises because it helps them to see the world, world different. So uh, after uh, Werner Herzog, we moved to the to the Kansas with my wife Romy. We uh, we came to the Shenyu. We visited amazing places uh, uh, where Martin Osa grew grew up. It was also the visiting of the tall grass and filming in tall grass prairie in a in a Kansas reserve, uh, which is uh, amazing landscape and. I have to tell that Kansas just uh, with Jackie and Lloyd just uh, gained my heart because it is really wonderful uh, Midwest country. This is a Romy filming in a tall grass prairie. And we visited that kind of place from a, from a, um, from a logic because you can see uh, Martin as a, a young boy because he was born in 19, uh, 1884. And he experienced uh, like the uh, raising the bisons there. So this is the famed picture uh, how the wildlife was treated in the United States, and even like the Amerindians and tribal people of uh, America just start appearing. And he, when he came to the Africa, he wants with the camera uh, and so with the photography lenses, he wants just to uh, be faster than in the, in the United States because plenty of people just disappeared, even the animals, without being able to be documented. So we did just a few pictures just to prove that um, uh, the most important places in the United States concerning Martin and Osa Johnson's story is the Safari Museum. Uh, so uh, this is just a picture uh, for, through the, our experiences and uh, our stay there. It was almost, I think, 10 days. We stayed there with Jackie and was filming in Kansas and other states, searching the, the archives, uh, reading newspapers from Jack London and correspondence from um, with Martin and his uh, his friends like Carl Akeley, Charlie Chaplin, and that kind of uh, and, and other people. This is Jackie with the uh, one of the uh, objects they kept in the museum is also Johnson's Winchester, so the gun which was used to guard Martin Wilde while uh, he was taking a picture of filming. Uh, just a few last say to, to, to mention, I will be quick uh, to, to, we also uh, were visiting the Library of Congress, like uh, both the, the center in uh, Washington DC, and then we came uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Packard campus, which is located outside Washington DC in a, in a small city called Culpeper. And uh, there is the archive. Uh, it is former uh, nuclear shed uh, from a very cruel reason because it kept the uh, nitrate film. So, uh, which is which are again, it's flammable, uh, and uh, it, it has kept all the films are are kept in a safe conditions. Because if you don't keep the film in a in the right place, so it, it happened what you can see uh, in this picture. It is just start disappearing and cracking. So uh, this is really important. So all of the most precious American or, and even internationally speaking, most precious things about Martin Johnson legacy is kept in, um, uh, in these corridors uh, in, under the standard temperature of, I think, four degrees of Celsius. Uh, uh, and all the, all the rooms are uh, just equipped uh, with anti-flaming situation. So this is was cooperation with people in uh, in um, uh, uh, in the Library of Congress, and it was amazing situation. You can also see it fr from in the in the documentary film. Just a few uh, last words. Uh, I was just I would like just to mention because it's very important when you are looking to the history of the even even Martin and Osa. Uh, film legacy because some of the it's very old. The pictures, their films, their Hollywood pictures are very old. And sometimes it couldn't be understood uh, by today's viewer. So it's really important to take uh, in mind the context of the time, uh, because if you look to the history, uh, what and just say a basic question: What was other so-called wildlife films during that time? It was there was none. The only films or remnants of um, wild animals. It was not speaking. This is even like the case of the uh, electricing electrocuting the elephants, elephant Topsy, uh, who was killed by uh, in New York because he killed uh, uh, a keeper. 
so it was a great causa. And uh, Thomas Alva Edison, when he was harvested, he just sent the cinematogra uh, cinematographers there to, to record. And it was one of the most popular um, film, so-called short film of the uh, wildlife animal, but being killed. Because people at that time thought that really the, uh, the wildlife is just like the beast. It was the way the media were talking. It, it was the way the hunters were speaking about the beasts uh, in, the, in the bush. And uh, Martin uh, and also think how to help, they help to rebuild uh, was that they were just uh, focusing and observing it in, in, comparison, in, compar uh, in co collaborations with Carl Akeley or uh, Blaine Percival in, in Kenya, they helped to uh, put the ground for a future uh, zoologist generation. And when we met Jane Goodell, uh, so she also remember seeing Martin's films as a young. Uh, so even they were really the first who tried to uh, change this approach. And it's, it's clear when you compare like the biggest uh, um, competitive fin film at the time, uh, if you compare like the gorilla. Uh, at the time of Martin Johnson, there was the King Kong, uh, Cooper's King Kong, and Martin make a movie called Kong Gorilla. And he wrote a book, Gorilla, and he gave totally different, uh, different uh, image of this new, quite new uh, mountain gorilla animal. And he says that it is not really the one who was raping the blondies and in, uh, in even not a pygmy uh, one, women in a, in, in a Congo. So Martin was also the, like the one who made amazing flying, uh, flying uh, journeys. He made amazing uh, footages. You can see it in the arc of in our movie. Uh, this is my favorite Martin pictures from a Turkana tribe uh, when he when the 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 plane his plane came to the northern Kenya region. Uh, which is famed by uh, the lack of shadows. And when the plane uh, has landed, so there was a, a group of uh, Turkana warriors approaching to the to the plane. And Martin has written it in, in his book. He just says that I was sure that uh, the Turkana warriors uh, were coming to just to admire the big plane. But what happened just quietly uh, surprised him. I just remember it from, from his book because this is the first time Turkana saw the people and they really don't care about the, uh, the plane itself. The only thing they care about at that time was the uh, quiet big shadow uh, the plane gave them just to be able to cool uh, for a while. They really don't care about uh, to the, for, the, for the plane, it's amazing. The shadow was much more uh, precious. Few or the last word for Martin. It, if you know uh, uh, Robert Flaherty and the most famous thing, uh, the na uh, film Nanook of the North. So it's really uh, good to say, and uh, Robert Flaherty has said it uh, uh, himself that uh, he made the uh, this famous, or at least uh, this is the mm, first documentary itself because it's called the beginning of the documentary history starts with the Nanook, right? And uh, he, he uh, one of his memory, he just mentioned that he, before he made Nanook, he saw Martin Osa films about uh, the cannibals in Oceania. So it, all these things are connected as we were showing and trying to say that this is something really, uh, re, uh, really uh, connected. So we couldn't simply say that the documentary film history started in, uh, with the Nanook. I think it's much more connected. Uh, because of the inspiration. Uh, at the very last thing, I will just go through a few uh, pictures made by the next expedition uh, to Africa. We were there in the, uh, dry, in the dry and raining seasons to get some images to the important to the film story. This is a few pictures from climbing up uh, the Mount Kenya uh, just to follow Martin Osa footstep. It was very really harsh for us because it was not successful for us, um, like it was uh, very tough. Uh, we almost get stuck there up, up uh, closer. It's it's wonderful uh, landscape. It's amazing. And almost it's important to the story of Martin Osa because they almost lost their life there. So this is uh, from uh, Mekindra Valley uh, when you are coming up to the mountains. 
We're also filming with the uh, with the uh, Rangers because uh, Robert O'Brien, the captain of Kenya Wildlife Service, is the one who uh, knows the history of Martin Osa. We met with him at that time. We've taken him uh, the pictures, and now, which is really lucky, uh, uh, that in the Marsabit there is a museum. It's really fresh news. There is a museum, uh, and with cooperation with Jackie, there are some pictures. This is uh, the night patrol, some filming with Romy. Uh, during filming at the Sheldrake Wildlife Trust. So a few last say, um, if you haven't seen the movie, so I think uh, on the uh, uh, web of the Czech Culture Center, uh, there is a link to the, our Vimeo, so it's still possible to, if you are interested in the movie, so you can, you can uh, watch the full movie, it's no problem. And uh, last word for our next project, because I made another film or preparing another uh, feature film, which is called When the Lion Roars. And it's it's a it's a paradox because even though the lion is in uh, in the name, so it's not that time in Africa. But it is a story of uh, uh, from the medieval times, from the medieval history of our of our country, uh, the story of our oldest uh, traveler. It was the Franciscan monk called Odoric uh, during the period of our uh, king uh, Ottokar II. And it's really amazing. Uh, it will be like a feature essay. So it will be the, or it is now the work we are now um, work or kept on hard working. So uh, I think it's almost one hour. So I get, or I, I will give uh, the word. You can, if you have a few more. M. Hi, yes. If you have a few more images, actually, I'd love to see them, and I think I'm not alone in that. So, if you wanna, um... I, I I push it just right. This is the very last one. Okay, <laughs> great, sorry. perfect. So I just, <laughs> I just tried to make it uh, up the uh, deadline. <laughs> thank you, thank you. This is You're really welcome. wonderful. The pictures are beautiful, and the stories you have behind them are just fascinating. And truly, the context that you can put all of them in. Is just mind blowing. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. Welcome. Um, I'm, I'm going to remind the audience that if they have questions for you, they can put them in the chat. And I'd like to invite Jacqueline Zimmer of the museum in Kansas to ask a question for our discussion. And hello. I think you can see the lake now. And, uh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello, <laughs> My husband and I went to the lake. Hello, Jan. Hello, Jackie. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. My question for Jan, I have a very good question. <laughs> you like the Lake Paradise? We had water when we were there. Yeah, I know. Uh, Jan, my question for you is, I get it all the time for Martin and Osa, is how many hours, or for them it was always feet of film, do you do for one documentary? I mean, how many hours do you think you actually filmed to get one documentary? <laughs> That's a good question. It's, it's uh, very hard because you did, this is 10 years, right, that you've done. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I would like to know just maybe the arc. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you for, for, for your question, Jackie. Uh, you know, even from uh, your own uh, experience when we were in a cancer, so uh, speaking about the arc of lights and shadow, it took us really, if I put the first Africa Square movie and the arc of lights and shadows we made, and we did it like our independent filmmakers, so that which means like it really took us a long time to uh, uh, to erase foundations. We just uh, quick our um, uh, we just try to get the money as much as possible. And uh, concerning the filming, so it, it it means like it was almost ten years of preparation because I have to put also the time of uh, preparing uh, because we became independent distributors because uh, when we were discussing the documentary uh, before it was made or finished, so we tried to uh, offer the cooperation with uh, some distributors in, here in Czech Republic and they didn't believe us that we will, or the, the movie will try to, or the, the movie will be in, uh, successful, uh, that people will be uh, eager to see it. And I'm lucky that we made it and we tried to make it and we succeeded to make it on completely on our own. So uh, it, it was really like the 10 years. And I don't count the, the, the hours. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a hundreds. Uh, there are hundreds of hours of material 
uh, plenty of time was uh, needed to to seeing uh, the archive materials and i'm really glad that i made the time uh, the, the movie in a time that i was young because i still have no problems with my memory but uh, i can't imagine myself to go through the archive materials when i when i will be like 65 years old i think i will have a plenty of problems to make it so it, it's really difficult even when, when we are making the independent documentary it's usually not the commercial way so that means like we put much more energy and um, and there are the, the, the next work is like the one we need to earn money so we try to make like the two kinds of movies the ones we really want to make it in our way uh, regardless to uh, to to the commercial stuff and i'm glad that uh, arc was succeeded because uh, it has more than 5000 people came to the cinemas here in czech republic and uh, if you look to the table it was much more successful than some of the uh, films uh, feature documents documents which were in the in the cinema so it was it was a pleasure for us thank you jeggy <laughs> wonderful wonderful um, another question we have from the audience is actually concerning the Johnsons and their predictions about the future of Africa. Do you think they were right? And what do you think is the future of wildlife in Africa? So it's a question of, to my or to Jack, or maybe to, to me and Jackie. Uh, so I will, I, will, I will just start through. Yes, I think Martin was one of the people who were very, uh, who was very uh, good at uh, predictions. So. Of course, uh, that he was one of the first uh, pioneer photographers. He was the one who almost invented the photo safari uh, in a in, in a way we know it from from now nowadays, which means like that this is the the touristic uh, mode that people came with the camera, not hunting and killing animals, but to taking pictures. We know this was much more successful alternative. Uh, it's, it's true what Susan Sontag also says that nowadays if the mass tourism, this concept after the 100 years or, and this is the story why I put the, uh, the leopard story with the, uh, with the queuing, uh, this is something which was functioning through the times, but in, at this time when we were heading thousands of people to some national park, so it's, it's, there is a need of regulations. And I think this is like the limits of Martin predictions because uh, he helped to, uh, to, to guard uh, and to save the, uh, the wildlife because he was uh, saying that the rhinos will be wiped out and it, it was almost true. So it, it, it was really the man at the, in his time and he was at the right place. Uh, and thanks to God, we got the images. If there is no Martin and Osa, so who guess God knows who, because his images were used uh, to inspire like uh, many of the important people like uh, Bernhard Grzimek made his uh, zebra plane according to the Martins. Uh, there was uh, jo uh, Joy Adamson uh, who were just, uh, uh, he admired the book Simba because the Simba book was the one of the book which presented the lion in a different way. Not this is a killer, but it is an animal with all these uh, amazing um, abilities. So I think he was he was right. And maybe Jackie can add something. Or <laughs> um, you can continue. I can uh, actually just going off of that, I have a somewhat related question. I'm wondering what it's like being for you as a Czech filmmaker to come into Africa. Do you have any pushback? Are people sort of doubting your mot motives or are people more open and, you know, trusting, I guess, of, you know, your own mission in that? You mean like b before we made the movie or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it was really difficult because even like uh, from my wife, when we just uh, say to our family that we just, uh, exactly, yeah, because, uh, because, for example, when he came to the uh, to the expression 2010, so uh, some of the family members didn't believe us that we can make uh, the expedition there, and why we are making it, it they, they don't see. So, of course, we have some, my family was the one who, uh, who trusted us and um, pushing our, we have uh, amazing family team and crew, so we were not alone. And of course, there, are, there were some people who said that this won't be working, but 
the only thing you can do is just to write with the right people. And uh, I'm glad that we, ma we made it even, it's really difficult to think about it uh, in a, uh, from, from the future to the past, because you just say, you just saw the questions. Maybe there were some, uh, uh, some uh, factors we haven't taken in mind and it, 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 it was right because uh, when I was too afraid, so I would have to go to, for, for the expression to, to that region at that time. Right. That makes sense. Well, I'm really glad that, you know, you were able to do that and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come back if you have another. Sorry, I have a beast of my own here. It just has <laughs> <a> nice <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but that's that's really great, you know, that you were able to do that. And obviously you were able to see some people there who were connected to the Johnson's own exploration. So that was that's just absolutely incredible. And congratulations. Um, we have another question from the audience concerning the, the dark rooms and the reason why you chose to shoot on film. Yeah, the, the reason why was uh, simply like, uh, you know, in the medieval times, uh, there were monks who came back to the, uh, to the, to the desert just to um, get uh, answers to the question. And uh, before I finished uh, FAM University, when we were because at the family university, I was studying photography, the classic photography. So I were cooperating with the, with the professor who, who were taught, teaching us uh, how to make the classic analog photography. And I love it. Uh, I love the smell of the, uh, the fixer and developer being in a dark room. And maybe this was a really important part of the movie, which tried to just uh, unite the, my, to my patients, Africa and the classic photography. And I, of course, I know that we uh, we made it more difficult, but in a, a simple reason. I just wanted to uh, myself to pass the, let's say, exam, maybe to to be able to get through it. And uh, when I made it, so called today, it's it's called like the experimental history. You you are making something which is not because we have a digital. Digital is much more. I don't know. It's more practical. Uh, you can run off out of the, of the film. Uh, you can send it on a post it on a Facebook. It's really blah blah blah. It's 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 amazing, but uh, the analog classic analog film helps you uh, really to appreciate every single picture because when you are making analog photography, uh, every single picture is uh, can be praised by the money because it needs your time and it needs your money. It needs to buy the developer. It needs your time to develop it. It needs to fix it. You have to present it to digitize it. So before you press the button, you really think of what you want to make and you have clear vision uh, about the pictures. And uh, I'm teaching workshops and photography here in Czech Republic and uh, I see very uh, obvious so a reason to, uh, to get back to the roots because it shows us uh, uh, away from this digital calamity because nowadays we have different problem. Uh, it is the amazing amount of pictures which are, uh, you know, just imagine on in Instagram. This is uh, something like a really calamity. And if you look to the picture of Johnson's when we are Martin's picture presenting in a zoo and in, in a museums, people can't believe it that uh, those pictures are 100 years old. They are so uh, overwhelmed by uh, by them. So it just shows that uh, really every work has to be done in a, in a certain conditions. And I believe that analog has still a lot to say to everybody who loves photography, not just for pure, you know, uh, shooters, <laughs> because of course it's a democratized media, media, but sometimes I think we have too, too much or too many pictures today. It's my absolutely. approach. No, absolutely. And I think the photos, not only of Martin and Osa, but also the photos that you showed us that you took yourself using their technology was just incredible in their vision and uniqueness and specificity. You know, you didn't shoot an unlimited number of pictures to maybe get a good one. There was a vision behind each image. And I think that's really unique and remarkable. So uh, thank you. Yeah. I, I'm afraid that's about all we have time for tonight though. So I'm gonna end it here. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, and you are right for the audience. If you haven't seen the film, I can't recommend it enough. You can find it on Vimeo and you can find the link on the Czech Center New York fa um, Facebook, but also on our website. So, Mirek, I, I see you turned your camera on. 
Oh yeah, because uh, you know, I I just listened and listened and I will listen for four hours and um, um, uh, you know uh, what's special about Rian is that uh, he's going uh, and doing things uh, uh, with his wife his own way and uh, you know that uh, there are a lot of filmmakers who does documentaries from their travels in in the Czech Republic. But uh, you you go much farther and and you are trying to understand you know uh, the, the the history and what other people were trying to do and and uh, try to find uh, a sense and and uh, kind of uh, um, connections between uh, the realities in the past and and present. So so I'm so happy that we had chance to 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 listen and that uh, it was kind of my dream. Uh, even I planned to go to Kansas last year uh, and uh, there was uh, the COVID. Uh, so uh, I'm so happy that uh, we are connected with, uh, 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 what is the city, Kansas, young Kansas, new Kansas, new um, Kansas. Kansas, what do you mean by the, the Kansas city or? No, I mean, where is the museum? Chenut, Chenut. Okay, so, and uh, also I'm so happy that uh, uh, Sharon uh, Valashek joined us and uh, we were supported by also the Consulate General uh, of the Czech Republic in Chicago. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> I thank Marek uh, and the Czech Center for invitation. It was my pleasure to, 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 to screen uh, the lecture. So thank you very much for, uh, for invitation. Thank you for staying so late. You know? <laughs> so good night, finally. <laughs>